the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry that you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the Lord is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than lepers and fierce, more fierce than evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead, their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold and they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offence, ascribing this power to his God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he why do you make men like fish of the sea like creeping things that have no ruler over them they take up all of them with a hook they catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet therefore they rejoice and are glad therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because of them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful shall they therefore empty the net and continue to slay nations without pity i will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what i will answer when i am corrected amen well for the next number of weeks god willing we hope to do a series on the book then of habakkuk it's a very timely word especially in the circumstances we find ourselves this day and in the very first verse of habakkuk in this version anyway it says the burden the burden and when a person becomes a christian let me say to you that the burdens that you have to carry are not less they're multiplied tenfold the good news is that you have someone you can cast your burdens upon you become a christian and you're going to face uh, opposition there'll be difficulty there'll be cross carrying there are many things that you would never have experienced if you had uh, remained a non-christian but there's also other burdens that the christian will experience those are inward that is now to deal for example you have a conscience where you feel your sin and your guilt you'll know and feel when things are not right you'll see things 
uh, in the world that you never saw before and you will be actually uh, upset by now the injustice that is confronted before one's eyes and not only that there's another burden that you will actually experience it will be this not that you don't know god but you'll have questions such as habakkuk had such as why doesn't god intervene and why doesn't he answer our prayers and what you find here in this book i want us to just consider it because it's a really interesting book of the bible and i'll tell you why because habakkuk's message is not actually spoken to other people first of all we thank god that he has placed it in this book it's actually one of the easiest books of the bible to understand because it's simply then the question that habakkuk has himself concerning what is taking place and it's that burden which we know god gave him in the first verse which he saw that he brings then uh, to god dr martin lloyd jones uh, obviously preached a series on this book and it's entitled from F fear to faith now i'm not going to take that title because i want to take a step back and a step further that this book actually is from perplexity to rejoicing and how someone with the questions that he has two questions which are placed before him how is it for example that the nation is as it is and god does not do anything about it and then he's got another problem when god does answer him such is the surprise that now he's really got a perplexity which he's got to work out actually when you go through this chapter for example there are five questions that he asks uh, for example there verse 2 and you will not hear verse 3 why do you show me iniquity and what we'd like to do is to look now tonight especially in the day in which we live and perhaps the very message we thank god for the message of habakkuk that people would need to know his church especially when uh, we're living in such days and that's what we're going to do first of all it's these questions the things that perplex him and i'm sure you must have had this yourself why is it that god does not hear and uh, then and why does not god intervene and then what you'll find is actually god is doing something and now he's really got the question because to be honest it's like this in our lives sometimes we think that god does not hear us that he's not answering our prayers the trouble is actually this god's ways are so much greater than our ways we can't see of what he's actually doing in the world and that's where we find habakkuk and that's what you have then uh, first of all there it is O oh lord how long shall i cry and you will not hear this is not now uh, a question of doubt or a lack of faith as i will show you in the book it's not so much from fear to faith but because faith is the foundation that this man has as will become clear to us he knows god and he can pray to god and as you see in verse 2 and will not save he knows that god can save but the question that he has is this concerning violence and that is the word you need to underline as you look at the great concern that he has and what he does is that he 
uh, brings then this cry to God of the violence that he sees around and the trouble that he is in. Look at verse 3. There's definitely no question about his lack of faith. He knows that God is doing something in his life. Do you know that in your life? Why do you show me iniquity that God is actually uh, revealing to him certain things which are now happening around him and is impressing upon his soul? God deals with us and he's dealing with this man. And what he sees then, first of all, are three things. Let me describe it to you in verse then three. Why do you show me iniquity? And what we're going to take now in this version is that that word for iniquity is the word you see for that which is not right and straight and which is crooked and perverse. Now, let me put it into the historical context of where Habakkuk was living and speaking. He's in Judah and he has lived through the reign of Josiah with all the reforms and the turning to God. And now Manasseh is actually on the throne. I can give you the dates of the prophecy they believe of this book, 686 BC to 642 BC. And he's living through four decades of iniquity, which has now overcome the land to which he sees. I'll give you one reference. Here it is from 2 Chronicles, chapter 33 and verse 6. This is just one reference to show you what was taking place under the, the rule of this king. Actually, I could take it from verse 3. He built high places, which uh, Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up the altars of Baals. He made wooden images. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And then what you've got here, look, in verse 6, he practiced soothsaying, witchcraft, sorcery, consulted mediums and spiritualists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord. And look, if I could say to you, there must have been this, that Habakkuk, you set iniquity before me. He even set a carved image, the idol which he made in the house of of God. And here's a man who goes to worship and he sees it. The sheer perversity with the worship of other gods. And that's what the burden is. Now, I don't know if you have a burden. Perhaps you do. And of all the things you're carrying in life, you've also got a burden of the state, the condition of the spiritual temperature, which is in uh, one's nation. And as a church, too. Now, when you go bad spiritually, you go bad, obviously, morally. And look, this is the point. Remember violence. And there in verse 3, and cause me to see trouble, for plundering and violence are before me. Now, I don't know if you've ever met uh, some of those prophets, no, which only ever see doom and gloom. I mean, it could be the best of years, but they'd only see the worst of years. But now what this man is actually seeing is this terrible oppression which is taking place, the violence where people are being robbed and plundered. And there is that violence which is then injustice which is before. God has a concern about the injustices within society. Now, I, by no stretch of the imagination, am I some kind of a freedom fighter and believing in some life of utopia within this world. Because I tell you, what happens here is the outworkings of sin within the world. But there is something that is just simply wrong. I remember listening to the news a number of years ago and it was dealing with some farmers in Africa. And you couldn't help but be taken of all the faults and failings and pointing the finger. And what had happened uh, is that someone spoke very articulate of how they were encouraged 
to plough their fields and plant then coffee beans. And they did it because they were promised this particular price and that would be good for the country and the economy. And then the, what happened was the economy, not their fault at all, but because of businesses and of governments and of pressures. Having done all that, they gave them pittance for their work. Now look, that is happening in the world tonight. It is utterly wrong. It is oppression. They are keeping people in a place of poverty which they can never then escape. That's what happens in this world. It happened amongst this people. And that's a burden to him. But it's not just that, is there? What you find now, and this is a concern, verse 4, therefore the law is, uh, look, verse 3, and the plundering and violence are before me. Verse 4, therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. And in the day in which he was living, how long, O Lord? How long? And you don't hear. There's iniquity. It's in the temple. Can't you see it? There are people just being plundered and robbed. And your law is paralyzed. It has no power. It cannot move. It's having no effect. And people's lives are just continuing as they go on. Have you not said that? As you realize the only hope that we have for a nation is this is that the gospel goes forth, that word of God in mighty power, and there's no effect. It's paralyzed. It's like if uh, it's gagged and uh, no lives are being changed. Nothing is happening uh, with it. That's the, that's the question and the perplexity that he has now look at uh, verse 5. Because don't think that God does not hear. He does hear. And like we said, what happens is, is that uh, he answers in such a way that is so, in verse 5, be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though I told you. And God is going to do something with the situation that he brings before God. And when he hears it, you know, well, he can't believe it. You know, it's, it's astounding. And actually, that takes place in our lives and the history of perhaps what we're living through. We want God to do something when the church is as weak and as powerless and perhaps gone off the rails in such a way, we ask God, don't we, to come and deal with it and says, okay, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to utterly then cast you off. I'm going to remove the clamp stand. I'm going to decimate it. You say, you can't. You know, God does things which uh, we just can't understand and believe the response. That is Calvary. That is the answer. You want to find God? The trouble is you'll never believe. It'll astound you. You've got to go to the place where great violence took place. You want to find him? Well, you know, no one would believe it. Now look, I want you to just think of this now for a moment in verse 6, because what he says he's going to do for indeed I am raising up Chaldeans, a bitter. Now here's the words that you need to undermark. Violence. Well, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. It's bitter. It's a hasty nation. Look at this in verse 7. It's terrible and dreadful. Look at this in verse then 8. They're more fierce than evening wolves. Look at that again in verse 9. They all come for violence. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send a nation 
which is even worse. And they're going to deal. Now, that's so strange. I, I, I don't... I want you to, if I can give you an up-to-date kind of uh, scenario. Now, I need you to pretend for a moment that you're American. No, that you are American. And I don't want to be political, but I'm just going to try and give you an idea of some mindsets that go on. And what happens is, is that uh, you are in America and it's uh, been a very religious place in the past. But what happens now, just like everywhere else, it's on the decline spiritually and morally. And it's in a, you know, a desperate state in some senses. And you are there and you want to see it changed. Now, they've had an election, either for good or for bad. And there are certain things that you just, you know, need to deal with. Now, I'm not going to give you fake news, but this is fact. And it ain't fiction. And it's a terrible thought when you think about it, that they are wanting to then legalise. If they have not already done so, it's been on so many years. And that's the termination and abortion of full-time babies. You can't believe it. You think of your little baby when it was born. You have the choice whether that lives or dies. Terrible, isn't it? Terrible. So what you do is this. Is that, you know, you know, you're going down. Oh, we've got to stop it. And God leaves you over to people who would implement or perhaps uh, carry out. And you say, where do we go? God does things which you can't even begin to imagine. Now, I'll explain that to you. What happens here? Violence that these people are going to come. There it is in these verses. God does something. I want you to think, first of all, of Calvary. Do you know that in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no death more violent and painful of suffering than crucifixion? And God gave up his son. And you can't work it out. That the death that the Lord Jesus Christ died, there has never been, there perhaps never will be, any form of dying that is more painful than the one that the Lord Jesus Christ died. And that is physically not alone, just spiritually, and all the rest that takes place, the things that God does. Not that God does it, remember, as I'll show you. Because we're living in a world, a world of sin and decay, a world filled with our own ways. That's the result of it. And uh, here it is. He says in verse 6, Indeed, I am raising up the called years. It's If I could put it like this to you, uh, if you were to think uh, of living in this country, you know, a thousand years ago, and then you had the news, the Vikings would come in. And all you've heard, oh no. You, you know, they don't want the Vikings to come. Well, these were worse than the Vikings. And they were more cruel than the Vikings. And yet, you see, God, he raises up nations. There are things happening in history. And you can't even begin to imagine the perplexity of that. Look at this now in verse 9. They all cry for violence. And their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like Stan. And they scoff at kings. And then what you've got is... All that takes place and what they're to do. If, if that bothers you and uh, you can't make sense of it, well, there's certain things that you need to do. Remember what we're saying. It's from perplexity to rejoicing. Actually, there's one thing you need to do in verse 12. 
you're going to have to get to firm ground to what you do know and you can be certain about. Now, verse 12 tells us, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? And that's the third question. That's actually in context with verse 11, ascribing this power to his God. Then Habakkuk says something that he does know. Look, God, you are the one. You're the everlasting God. You are the one who's always been. You're the one who is utterly holy. You are my God. You are my Lord. You see, when you can't understand certain things, what are happening in life and in this world, and you can never make sense of it, you've got to have, you know, something that you can know. And he knows that God is. And he does exist. And he is holy. And that line in verse 12, we shall not die, is the exact reading, whatever Bible you're reading, it's we shall not die. He knows of the faithfulness of God. He is the Holy One and that God is the one who is true. He's appointed them for judgment. And there's a judgment that he is doing in this world. How God works. Judgment begins at the house of God. But that doesn't mean just that he doesn't judge even other people. But look what you find here. Verse 13 you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. That's the reality. When we're talking about all the suffering that takes place, the killing, the oppression, the perversions, the sickness, you see, God has nothing to do with sin. He is holy and true, and he can't even look at those things which are taking place. He has given people over to their free will and their consequences, and yet there's nothing that happens within this world which is without his knowledge and his then determined will in, uh, in these things. And here it is then in verse, uh, in verse then 13. And hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. There's the fourth question. How come we're bad? Now what you're going to do is send a kingdom which is worse. How is God involved in all this? Well, it's amazing how these things work out in the world. From verses 15 to verses 17, there's a picture there of a hook, of a net, and of a dragnet, and of this uh, net which is being thrown over all the nations. These Chaldeans were going to deal not just with these people, but every single nation they came to. That's what they say is in verse 17. And they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity. And that's what took place with the Chaldeans. Let me give you a, a more modern day example. If you think of the Nazis, a very cruel um, regime and you know that they killed six million people and the devastation that they caused they were defeated and the communists and stalin had a lot to do with that didn't he you know we don't know if we would have defeated hitler if it wasn't for you know the sheer merciless machine of the Russian forces. And you know something? What Hitler did was just a percentage to the 20 million that they butchered without thought. 
And God deals with nations and peoples. And what he does is that uh, he's not just doing one thing in dealing with his church and his people, but with all and many iniquities which are in the world. You could take perhaps uh, this day in which we live and you think of the coronavirus. I'm just, uh, I want you to consider that. Um, on so many levels that has affected people's lives. It affects the church, the gospel going forth. It affects also um, nations, politics, governments being brought down, uh, environment, so many things that God can do. Someone has said like this, God can make a straight line with a very crooked stick. And that's what he sees. He's got big questions. I mean, look, we're dealing, aren't we, at this time with the rise of China. And I know you may all be very excited about the Christians which are in China. But actually, China is the number one atheistic country in the world. The church has been surrounded and persecuted. You're not free in religion to teach your children. And it's growing in its power. You just don't know, do you? And yet God raises up nations. But he's got a work to do. And sometimes it may even to teach. Even, you know, people. Even in the West. Islam, which is on the increase. One day of great persecution may rise. You don't know or understand. But you need the bottom line, don't you? There's a God who is holy. And we will not die. Here's the last thing. It's from chapter 2 and verse 1. What do I do? I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Now, a number of things then just to close tonight. And this, and this, this first of all, what he decides to do as he's a prophet, he takes his position and he's not going to panic. You now people do. The church panics. What's going to happen? He's from everlasting to everlasting. That's the first thing. The, the second thing that you need to do when you don't understand what is around you, go to those things that you do know and that you can be certain of. Do that. Look, the third thing that you're going to do, I am going to watch, I'm going to see, and listen to what he's going to say to me. Don't be like those people who say, what is God doing? Where is he? And all the rest. They're only ever talking about God to others. You can talk to God, and you can pray to him. Do you know what else you can do? You can, you can wait. Wait. And see. And trust in him. Now, that's Habakkuk's great perplexity. And I'm so thankful that God has given that to us in his word. Because that's the world that we live in. I'll just close with a word of prayer and then we'll have some questions. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we are those this night which have many questions ourselves. We're thankful for the way that you have spoken and that we have known that you have dealt with us in this world in the past. You have plans and purposes that you're able to work out in spite of our sin. And that even though people have no idea of what is taking place, 
we're thankful that you are the God who is active in history and you're working in nations and you're dealing and bringing forth uh, for your kingdom and for your glory. We ask, O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, that you will uh, make this word cause peace in our heart, that we then will uh, grow uh, from those doubts and from the anxieties that we have, that we will truly come to trust in you. Amen.